first question is basically okay, this guy's asking, hey Alan, uh, I say we pre we do pretty well in e-com. We do around eight figures annually. Uh, when should I hire a CFO or a fractional CFO? Uh, I think if you're doing eight figures, I would say immediately. Yeah, eight figures is a um, I would say um, I'll say even when you're doing like seven figures, uh, it'll be a great time for you to hire a CFO, right? Because you have enough I would say metrics that you should be looking at. You have enough revenue. You have enough tax savings, and there's just a lot of uh, financial and operational issues you should be looking at. Business strategies you should be really planning for, and you have you're gonna have you having tons of tax issues at this point. You know, if you especially if you're selling in the U.S., you're gonna have you probably trigger sales tax everywhere. If you're selling in Europe, you probably have a lot of VAT tax to worry about. So uh, yeah, I would say immediately look into it if you're already eight figures and having a having hire a, a, either a frac- fractional or full time CFO. Okay. By the way, Alan, I think your clubhouse audio is mute. Uh, yeah, I muted my mic. Can we unmute it? Uh, yeah, I think yeah, so. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I'm muted now. Sure. Okay. Can. Uh, next question. Uh, is there an automated way to do bank reconciliation? Uh, for my Shopify e-commerce business, and is there any software that does this automatically as well? I I don't know anyone that's like super any software is like super intuitive as far as doing it automatically. I think they all involve some forms of I would say you know human interaction, you know some some human interaction to get the reconciliation to a perfect form. Um, if there are software that's gonna help you get there, I would say. Um, I know um, there's one, there's a startup right now called Flowcast, right? Um, and that's uh, California based. That's supposed to make it a lot easier to do bank reconciliation because they use a hashtag system mm. of making sure that your um, reconciliation always matches GL using a hashtag. So it does it does makes it a lot simplifier. But um, I, I mean, it's still it's still for accountants. You know, it just makes accountants' jobs easier. It's not for like the everyday business owner to for for their purpose. I would say. So okay. um, I, yeah, I mean, if you really just look, if you're just really like looking for your accounting team. For something to make their job easier, Flowcast might be something that you can look into. Okay, so technically, bank recon is still done very manually, right? Yeah, very manually. Okay. Uh, I mean, I think I don't think there's any software that like automate automate the process. It's it still involves some human interaction. Okay, can next question is hi, Alan. How do I use uh, depreciation and acceler- accelerated deductions to basically reduce my taxes uh, for the year? Yeah, yeah. I mean, just just because just because you you you're able to ask this question. Just shows me that you know you already done some, I'll say, research into the world of accounting and tax, and know about one of the one of the, like I'll say secrets, right, of why tax deduction or you know why real estate is uh, so lucrative because of this thing called depreciation, right? Depreciation is kind of really misunderstood, but basically it's a tax deduction that you take on the wear and tear on an asset due to the passage of time. Um, they allow you to do this, right? So it represents how much of an asset's value that you're using up because of the passage of time. So usually it's done by straight line. So to give you an example, if you have an, an, a piece of machinery that's worth $100,000 and, you, and uh, it's deemed to have a 10-year useful life. So usually that means you can take $10,000, a depreciation tax deduction on your tax return every year, right? Which is okay, right? Mm-hmm. $10,000 better than nothing. But um, that means $90,000 of that you can't take until the other nine years. But due to recent changes with the IRS and Congress, they have made it extremely beneficial for small business owners to invest in their business and invest in capital assets. What this means is there, there are certain tax laws right now that let you accelerate the depreciation you're taking. So instead of 10,000, you can possibly take all 100,000 or 80,000 or some amount of that where um, you get a benefit immediately a t- immediate tax write off 100% of the value of the asset that you're buying. So if the $100,000 asset, you can take it year one, which is mm-hmm. crazy, crazily powerful if you think about it, right? To be able to take a, a, a whole 100% tax deduction right away for such a big asset. So something you should really take advantage of and look into, um, especially if your business owner is investing in the US and really grown big enough where you have machinery and equipment. Yeah. So I would say people in e comp for example, uh, I would say if you're really doing custom stuff, right, there'll be manufacturing, but you probably won't be having that sort of deduction come true, right? So I'm guessing yeah, there'll be more inventory and... That's exactly right. If you're just drop shipping, okay. this probably won't apply to you, but if you're starting to be a branded business, we have a custom a custom manufactured good, mm-hmm. you should really evaluate um, you know, how much tax saving you're getting from well, really none, right? If you're doing it in China versus if you, if you did this manufactured good in the US, right? 
if you neither do neither the assembly part of the of the goods or the actual creation of it in the U.S. There's a lot, a lot of benefits now that can actually really help business owners with the tax saving portion of it. Yeah. Next question is, uh, what's the difference between a bookkeeper, an accountant, a CPA, and a CFO? Yeah, so th- these are all, I-, I would say, terms that are commonly thrown around uh, in the world of accounting, right? Um, so let me, let me break it down for you, right? A bookkeeper, I would say, is... I don't want to use the word lowest, but it is, I guess, the most untrained uh, version of an accountant because they're really just, uh, anyone can become a bookkeeper, right? Mm-hmm. You don't have to be licensed. Uh, you can probably just do like six weeks of training on QuickBook Online. They, they offer certifications um, and then you become a bookkeeper. So um, it's kind of same with kind of accountants, right? Accountants kind of like attached, uh, attach a lot of uh, people. A lot of people can, can't claim they're an accountant. Um, places like, you know, h and Block, uh, Liberty Tax, like these like tax preparation places, they hire a lot of what they call accountants, but really it, it just they just go through like a six to eight week training mm-hmm. of their to use their software and they become an accountant that they, they can do like basic taxes for you, right? Um, so I would say they are good if you're, if you're just looking for someone that does like very basic, simple versions of your tax and bookkeeping. But if you're really looking for someone that's more, I would say certified as that needed, you know, gone through the hours and well, really years of certified training, licensing, and work experience behind it, you probably want to look for like, like a CPA mm-hmm. to do your tax and bookkeeping, right? They're licensed to perform you know, certain special accounting and finance functions that I would say your typical accountant wouldn't be able to do, right? One of them is, of course, auditing and reviewing financial statements and being able to file a report with the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission. Um, they can also represent clients in front of the IRS, right? If you get um, an audit in the situation, so, uh, you know, if you're just bookkeeper and account, you won't be able to do that, right? So there's certain rights that only a CPA will be able to do. Um, so I would say the difference is just about the expertise that you're looking into. If you're looking for somebody that's very simple, basic, you don't need a lot of strategy and, and tax planning behind it, bookkeeper and account is fine. But if you look something to be more advanced, I would say you look for someone who's a CPA or even a CFO, but I guess CPA or CFO, you, a lot of people can claim their CFO also. Yeah. You really need to know what, what licensing they have done to it, right? Do they have an MBA? Do they have a CPA, a CFA? Like, what, what do they have, right? Okay. Yeah. Uh, next question. I think this will interest Strahenia as well. Uh, so, like, I make a lot of money in econ business, for example. How do, how do I actually pay myself out of my business? Am I tax on the company level and then tax again on the personal income level? And what is the best way to structure to pay myself to basically minimize my taxes at the same time? Yeah, so this question is very um, involved because I'm sure it's someone who has, you know, heard a lot of accounting terms or just seen a lot of things on forms, about, right? But really, you got to take it to a simpler form. If you're going to be asking this question, it's about what business structure your uh, entity set up as, right? Um, if you're set up as a C-Corp, it seems like it will be that question where, where it might tax on the company level and then tax again on a personal level. Then the, the answer is yes. If you're a C-Corp, your first tax on a company level, right? Because it's a whole, wholly separate entity than you. And then once you want to take it out because you're a shareholder of the company as neither salary or dividend, then your, that salary or dividend is also taxed on your personal level, on your personal income tax. So it's, do, it's double taxation on that level. But if you're set up as an LLC, um, LLC is just what they call a flow through entity, which means all the income from the LLC flows directly to your personal income. So there, mm-hmm. there's no double taxation that way. And it's very simple. It's just whatever income that makes, minus deductions, minus tax, um, tax things you're able to take for it, then that's that's the profit. That's what you have you end up at being taxed by the government. Um, and then the, the, the last part is what is the best structure to pay myself to minimize tax? Yep. That again is really dependent on you know the, the business entity that that you have formed, right? If you have formed yourself as an LLC, there really isn't, I would say, a brilliant or like you know, a, a, a light bulb way of taking money out other than, um, you know, you, you can take a salary or you can just take a owner's straw, but really it's going to be taxed the same way. Where a C-Corp, I guess there are options because you can either take a salary or you can take a dividend out of the company, right? And at the current state right now, uh, dividend, because they're they're um, considered capital gain, uh, a capital form of capital, capital asset, you can actually get a reduced tax rate on any kind of capital gain assets right right now mm-hmm. so i would say if you're a c-corp you might be considering doing more dividend right now versus salary 
um, as a as a way of saving money on taxes. Okay, so w- why wouldn't anybody just take uh, like a very minimal salary, and then uh, for the dividends, I just take the maximum on that? Yeah, you you can you can definitely you can definitely set set it up to do that if you want to. Um, it's more about you know what other situations that you may be in where you want to claim some divi- uh, like some salary, right? Because mm-hmm. the IRS is always going to look like what is your role in that company, mm-hmm. right? If you're a CEO, is it reasonable that you only take ten thousand dollars salary a year? No, they 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 want to look at what what reasonable amount of salary for the amount of work that you put in for the company is. Mm-hmm. So you can't actually just claim a very, very small amount and try to get away with it. They, they're going to measure you against the, the market of what a reasonable person in your role for a company of this size should be earning as a salary, right? So there's a, there's a range you can get away with for sure, Jonathan, but I, w- I wouldn't try to claim like a thousand dollar a year, you know? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Got it. Yeah. You're in you trouble with the IRS. Yeah. And, and you say dividends are tax lower than the personal income tax rate. Am I correct? What's the Yeah. Difference? Yeah. Um, I was the personal personal side is, is around ten to thirty eight percent right now, mm-hmm. uh, but I think the highest you can be taxed on uh, dividend I believe is twenty percent max. Okay, Got it. yeah, so it's so it's a pretty good difference, right? If you're if you're if you're at one of the higher earners, you can be at thirty eight percent, but dividend you only be at twenty percent. So that's an eighteen percent difference. Okay, yeah. yeah. Let's move on to the next question. Okay, so from your clients uh, and from what you see, right, which ecom businesses? Uh, the most profitable? Um, I think the, the ones who are most profitable have found ways to, you know, not just get a client um, and only have them flow through once, right? Let me, I guess I should explain that better. So basically, once you have a client that's, uh, not sorry, a customer that's on your, your customer list, right? You got to find other ways of withdrawing even more money out of that customer, right? Getting that lifetime value out of that mm-hmm. customer. Mm-hmm. So if you're running pay ads, you get the customer once, they buy from you once, that's great. But then can you retarget that customer again and again, do maybe email marketing, right? Do organic traffic ways or just doing retargeting ads, right? To get them back to your site to buy them again and again, again, right? You, you got to find other ways of increasing that customer's lifetime value and e com businesses that are very successful in doing that are the ones that are able to grow the fastest, right? I mean, it, it's really two main factors for, for e-com. It's neither can you keep paid ads under control, that's one, and two, can you keep good margin on your, um, on your product that you're selling, right? If, if it costs you too much money, if, you're, if your gross profit, profit margin is not good, you're probably not gonna be doing too well because you're just not gonna be able to grow that fast, you know? Your, your break even is too hard to reach. Okay. So that's gonna be, that's one side that you gotta control. The other support is how well you're, pay ad is but hey if you can just break even at that front you can also just you know just retarget that customer over and over again with, with, with more um, i would say cheaper way of, of getting that customer back again upsell okay. them cross sell them you know use other apps and stuff too i'm not sure whether this is confidential but like what what's a healthy uh net margin that uh the e-com guys should aim to to have for their business for example like the business is stable uh cash flow is you know healthy and stuff like what's a healthy net margin that they should be looking at? Yeah, if you're talking about like profit margin, they, yep. they got to they, they have to stay above ten percent. If they can't stay above ten percent, it's usually there's just signs that are um, you know they're just not running their business efficiently enough. Um, they do because their ads are too high, too um, too costly, hmm. or their inventory their inventory cost is too high you know, from their supplier. They have to fix something to get above 10% each month. So we, we really look at that. Like we, we make sure that if they're not 10%, we, we warn our clients immediately that something's wrong and we should fix it right now. Okay, can I move on to the next question. Uh, this guy asked, so I'm drop shipping from a USA warehouse. Uh, does it give me tax nexus in that state or only if I'm holding bulk inventory? Question mark. Um, it's kind of a great area. Um, usually if you're just drop shipping, the answer is no. And if you're where and if you're warehousing inventory in the US, then 100 percent you have some kind of a tax nexus and you have to pay um, sales tax to that state. Um, but the, the real answer is the, the IRS is considered what they're gonna call physical nexus, right? Affiliation, which means any kind of connection you have to a state, right? So if they see that inventory is coming out of a all your inventory is coming out of a of a state, they might consider that that you have physical nexus there. So I, I would say, I would say you, I, I don't want to answer this too specifically because it really depends. It's really situation based, but I can tell you a situation where this wouldn't apply 
if of all your inventories being drop shipped, say from China, right, to the U.S., and you have no physical presence in the U.S. other than that, right there, like just you're just drop shipping things from China to U.S. customers, then there'll be no taxable nexus at all that you created. So just for international e-commerce owners out there who may be curious about that. Okay, can and what the next question? This guy is very very specific. Hi, Ellen. Uh, can I use the form seven o nine to bypass the gift tax if I give over fourteen thousand dollars? Okay, I'm not sure what that is, but uh, please do explain. <laughs> yeah. So actually, the annual gift exclusion for 2020, um, I think 2021 too, is fifteen thousand dollars now. Um, basically, what the form seven o nine is is um, if you want to give give someone money, right? That's greater than fifteen thousand dollars. You have to fill out this form. Um, okay. And what this form is just what this form does is just it's just a reportable. It's just a reporting reporting form. You can think of it like that, right? It's just a just compliance form. And what it's saying is, hey, this year um, I want to give someone um, I don't know my my good friend Jonathan forty thousand dollars, right? He's such a good friend, and you're just basically filling out this form to say I'm doing that, which is fine because every person in the U.S. has a lifetime. Um, gift exclusion right and that number is around 11.5 million so really as long as you don't give more than 11.5 million you're always okay okay <laughs> giving you know more than 15,000 but you have to report it you have to tell the government you're doing that you know this is really more for rich people you know who has yeah, yeah, like yeah. really big <laughs> estates you know yeah. to not be able to escape um, paying taxes because a lot of time you know, they, they can just pass it down generation 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 right and avoid taxes yeah uh, but they're, that's why the set number is so high, 11.5. So really, if they have a, under 11.5, it's all, it's all fine. Be giving it to your family, for example, right? Passing it down to your grandchildren, all that. Okay. Yeah. Next question. Can I put my net profit from my business into a 401k in order to avoid paying a higher income tax bracket? Oh, yeah, 100%, Jonathan. This is actually one of the smartest things you can do as an e-com owners to not only lower your taxable liability for the year, but also to really set yourself up for a great retirement, right? So, um, and, and just, just to go a little bit further on that, if you're a, just a solo owner in the e-com business, which all I think a lot of dropshipping business are, just one, one, one member, uh, single member LLCs, um, you can set up what they call a solo 401k. And solo 401k is especially powerful. Um, I think I, I touched over this in part one a little bit, but pay, basically instead of like $19,500 contribution limit that most people have, they work a nine to five job, you have a $58,000 contribution limit in a solo 401k. So basically you can think of it as being able to shelter $58,000 of income you made this year away into a, this, this retirement fund. And that's $58,000 you don't have to pay for, which doubles um, to $116,000 if you're working with a spouse, um, which I think oh, uh, one of, one of, one of uh, we, got, we had an e, 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 e-com client kind of uh, message just about, about that too. He's working with his, his wife right, in the business and he, because he, because that's his spouse, it still counts as a single member LLC, which means he qualifies for this hundred sixteen thousand dollars that he can shelter every year. Uh, next question, I think, is a bit loaded question, so I think you can take a bit of time to think about it. But this guy asks, "What are some ways that I can reduce my personal income tax when I own the business and pay myself through the business?" So I think it's a bit related to the question before, but uh, I think the answer to this one's going to be a bit long. So. Um, yeah, I mean, um, it's a very general question, right? But there's, there's really plenty of ways where you can reduce your personal income tax. One, one of the ways we kind of already talked about, which is through the 401, having a solo 401k plan, right? Um, being able to really shelter a really large portion of your income, 58000 possibly $116,000 of your taxable income away. Um, and then, of course, there's just a lot of year-end planning things you can do, right? Where you can achieve dramatic savings by taking action at the end of the year. Some of them you can do you can do because you're a cash basis tax player, which a lot of um, uh, e-com owners start out as, which includes, of course, just prepaying for uh, expenses ahead of time, um, such as buying um, any kind of apps, right? Any kind of Shopify apps, any kind of software that you rely on. Um, also, by buying prepaying for inventory is another great way. Um, if you know you're gonna be spending this inventory, you just prepay it and during uh, year end for next year. You can also mm -hmm. delay your billing if you're an agency, right? And then, of course, there's certain deductions and credits that have limitations that, pre that prevent you from using them fully in the current year, mm -hmm. but uh, they, per they per permit you to carry over the future year, right? So don't make sure you don't, don't forget about those things. 
Mm-hmm. Um, there's also contrib- uh, charitable contributions, right? Uh, another way to reduce it. If you, if you know you're going to be, you know, if you're a charitable person, you're going to be giving away some of the money. That's another great way to, to reduce your tax. Uh, there's, mm-hmm. there's, of course, a lot of these tax credits and tax uh, deductions you, can, you should be looking into. Home office deduction is one that we often talk about. A lot of our business owners work from home. And uh, this, you know, just two ways of calculating that a simple way, which you can take while having any accounting knowledge and a more complicated way, um, the actual expense deduction, but it's very beneficial for you to know about it because it can, the difference could be, you know, tens of thousands of dollars, you can take a more tax deduction. So definitely look into that. Um, and then of course, when we kind of talk about this too, right? You can also look into other ways of extracting money out of your businesses. That's just not straight salary. You can also try doing, doing kind of a dividend plan where you pay yourself a dividend out, out of your company. Um, you can also try uh, doing what they call family income splitting, which is also very, very powerful, by the way, Jonathan. It's basically if you involve more of your family members in your business, mm-hmm. um, you can pay them a, 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 some sort of salary right, for doing a, something for your business. For example, you, you have a, a son and a daughter who's of age, of college age, right? You can treat them as, hey, one person, you run my inventory. You're my inventory manager now. Hey, uh, my daughter, you're my social media uh, manager now, right? And you pay them fifty thousand dollars each. Well, that's fi- that's a hundred thousand dollars that salary you're paying to them, which reduces your overall taxable income burden that you have. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So you treat so, them as employee, basically. Yeah, you treat them as employee to lower, but but then they're not actually employee because they're part of your family. Okay, but, <laughs> but you need to pay healthcare, totally right? You need to pay uh, healthcare. Yeah, but that's okay. Uh, that's to- <laughs> totally that's totally allowed, right? Well, yeah, but, but the thing is, as, as you're the head of the family, you're going to cover the yeah, healthcare yeah. anyway, right? So, so yeah, you might as well, right? Um, but yeah, there's, 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 a lot of, there's a lot of credits and benefits. I mean, this question is really endless, right? There's also okay. like health savings account you can look into. Um, yeah, it, it, it's just a lot of things you can do. To yep. do that, that, that's that's the, really the power of, and the essence of tax planning, right? Okay. By not doing all these things, you, you're way overpaying your taxes every time. Okay, got it. Okay. Uh, Okay, so those are that's the end of basically uh e-commerce, general e-commerce related questions and stuff. We'll move on to something a bit more specific to Amazon FBA, so fulfillment by Amazon type of businesses. So the first question uh the audience has for you is number one, uh, what is a sales tax certificate or license? Uh do I need to apply for it? And uh when do I actually need to apply for this? Yeah, it's a great question. So a sales tax certificate basically just gives you the legal right to collect sales tax from your customer for a certain state. And you apply for it only, only when you trigger certain nexus rules in those states, right? And one of the baseline numbers we look for is near $100,000 in a certain state or about 200 transactions. And I'm saying this very generally because a lot of states have followed this rule, but a lot of states don't. Mm-hmm. They may have higher limits. Um, but basically you wouldn't apply for it unless you know you're gonna be triggering sales tax nexus in those states. Right, doing it beforehand doesn't really benefit you, and really it just flag you as someone that you know may need to pay for it, may pay for sales tax in those states. But so I would do some, I would do some sales tax planning, look at your customer concentration, and mm-hmm. see which state you're about to trigger sales tax nexus, and plan around that. Right, neither make sure you don't go over that for the year, or if you know you you have to go over it over that threshold in that year, then know that this is this is the time when you need to apply for it and start really remitting your sales tax for that state. Okay. Next question is, hi, Alan. How do I calculate a COGS or COGS on my Amazon FBA business? So COGS stands for cost of goods sold, uh, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Cost of goods sold, uh, you know, it's the direct cost associated with your sales, right? You, you sell an item that that's kind of your COGS, right? And most of the time, it, the, the main factor is the amount you pay to the factory with supplier for your goods, right? Most of the time it's just that, but other times there may be some other costs associated with it, which includes like freight costs. You can actually put towards your cost goods. So if you wanted to, um, you know, tariffs or duties, you know, import duties costs, those are the things you can include in it. And, you know, if you're making the goods yourself, maybe costs associated with like fabricating the good yourself mm-hmm. and other miscellaneous fulfillment expenses you can also add to if you wanted to. So that's what makes up cost goods sold. And once you once you add up all these costs, that's kind of your co- your your COX number. And to really really, if you're if you're a cash basis, uh, you know, doing accounting, COX is pretty simple, right? You you pay a vendor ten thousand dollars for a thousand units. 
then you just divide your 10,000 by 1,000 units and there's your COGS. Most of the time, that's all you need to know. Um, unless, you want, unless you know that you have other costs associated with bringing that item over to you, you may want to add that to it, right? Like if, for example, if you're buying a large bulk inventory order, right? Maybe the actual item is $10,000, but shipping the item from China, maybe add another $5,000 to that. So really you should be saying $15,000 is your total cost divided by 1,000 units. And that's the number that you should be recording every time you sell an item. Mm. Okay, can I move on to the next question? Uh, so even I'm curious about this. So, Alan, how how do I forecast cash flow in my Amazon FBA business? So we are selling units now, uh, and it's growing fast. But I do need to plan for cash flow to buy more inventory in the future. So how do you guys forecast cash flow normally, and how do you advise uh, your clients to do so? Yeah, do you understand forecasting- the question? Yeah, yeah I, I think I understand. I think I think forecasting cash flow is not anything that's like too complicated. It, but it does it does take um, it does take some historical data. I would say, right? You kind of need to be aware of you know how well you're doing bookkeeping for your business to forecast correctly into the future, right? A lot of time, um, you know, forecasting is is a lot based on a lot of historical context of how your business been running. Mm-hmm. And how much cash you have outstanding after each month, how much free cash flow you have, right? That you have in each month. And that really sets up a way for you to basically do your forecast for the next six to 12 months. And, you know, some larger businesses even forecast weekly because that's how much cash moves in and out all the time, you know? Mm-hmm. And no matter how far you choose to forecast, you have to factor in a lot of other things, right? Like, how's the market moving? What's the demand of my goods in the future? What's the availability of new inventory that's gonna be coming in? You know, like what are what are these one what are one time expenses that can be that can tie up a lot a lot of my cash? Um, you know, what what are other factors that I need to know about? You know, that's gonna use up my cash, right? So if you have if you don't consider all these factors, your your cash forecast becomes very um I'll say you not not useful um, because an in, in out of date forecast is super useless, right? You don't you want to make sure that your forecast is always up to date and always factor in all these things we just talked about. Um, so when, when you're thinking about your forecast, you got to think about um, a lot of time, the simplest thing is just operations, right? Uh, what is, what, you got to predict your sales, your expenses, your profit for, for, each, for each month. Um, you need to find out how much inventory is left. You need to find out how much cash you need to be tied up into inventory. Um, and then also, if you, if you have any kind of debt in your business, you need to find, find out the financing side of it. How much, how much of that loan I need to pay back each month? How much interest is associated with that loan? that payback, right? Um, so there's, there's a lot of factors into forecasting. Um, you, you may also, also look, look at, does the owner plan on taking money out in any time to six to 12 months, right? Is that gonna cripple my, my, what my, my operational cash flow is, right? So there's a, lot, I mean, there's a lot of factors and there's a lot of what they call timing that, that, that's what makes this so difficult. And that the timing of when you take money out, uh, when you need to pay for inventory, of uh, when something's gonna tie up your cash is, all these factors you got to consider and build as what they call a model, a cash flow model mm-hmm. to get you the most up-to-date forecast and let you know, this is the amount of money I can, I can safely take out in the next six to 12 months to do other things with. And what they usually do with this, Jonathan, is they either say, I'm do, I'm, I need to know this because I'm trying to invest into my business by um, hiring a lot of employees, right? To grow the business. Or I'm trying to build a different brand, a different entity. I need to know how much cash flow I have. Or I need, I'm saying I'm trying to diversify my cash flow because I'm trying to invest in real estate with stock or bonds, right? And, and that's why I need this cash flow. Or some people are just doing it because they're trying to see how long they can last, right? They try to actually just see the burn rate of how much cash they yeah. need to keep the business going before they run out. That, that's something, that's another reason why you do a forecast. Well, knowing that, you know, six months down the line, you'd be like, oh, shoot, I'm out of money. And not knowing that is terrifying for business owners, I would say. Okay. okay, so actually, that sounds really painful. You just have to be on an ongoing basis. Uh, watch the numbers really closely, basically. Uh, yeah, yeah. You, you, okay. have, you have to be constantly <laughs> watching numbers. I mean, as you, as you get to the seven to eight figure mark, it's become more and more important, right? Yeah. As, as the, more, the bigger your business, the, really the more risks you have of yeah. everything just kind of like falling apart because you always have so much cash tied up into your business, right? You're, you're buying like large, like six figure of inventory every time, right? For example, if you have a, a warehouse somewhere. Right, and, and and you're you're paying out so much cash. Like I, the the client, the econ clients we've seen, it's just like you know six seven figure going in, six seven figure going out every month, and the remainder is your you know your net profit, for example, right? And just so much cash movement that you know not controlling that can make every all this 
or this part or this fall apart for your, for your business. Okay. Okay. And move on to the next question. Uh, how do I value my e-commerce inventory? So I'm guessing the, the value of the inventory decreases over time, right? Uh, but yeah. How how yeah, does I yeah. Yeah, I, I kind of understand the question, but basically it 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 does a lot of factors into value inventory, right? Not just for e-com, but, but for any type of business that uses e-com. A lot of time you have to look at uh, what they call inventory turnover, right? It was just how fast your inventory is going in and out the door, right? Mm-hmm. Anytime that you have inventory, that's what they call um, uh, stale, which is not a non-moving inventory. That usually is is a factor that where where your inventory value lower because that's like inventory that's just not in demand anymore, right? So you got you got kind of kind of consider does it still hold the same value as it did when you first purchased it? And of course, other factors as you know your inventory for some reason is food related, obviously as expiration date, right? And as it get closer to expiration date, of course that value of that inventory also get lower. So. Um, you really need a good, if you want to get to a, like a, a seven, eight bigger mark, you really need to have a good inventory system where you know that the, the inventory you're getting in is when, when you're getting the inventory in, first of all, and how fast, how, how, how much is moving in and out, right? Um, the two most common way of looking at it is native FIFO or LIFO, which FIFO stands for first in, first out, first and LIFO is last in, first out. So usually um, businesses, depending on what type they are, choose one of the two systems because they didn't want the inventory that, that comes in right away to go out right away, or they want, you know, they want it to be the last thing to go out because they want the older inventory to go out first, right? Because mm-hmm. they're, they're older, they're, they, they could possibly have lower value. So, I mean, I- I- inventory management is quite complicated because of that. And actually bigger businesses, what they should do is what they call si- uh, doing a cycle count, which means every once in a while, so every quarter, or a month for every annually, they should have someone go and count their inventory and make sure it still matches what's on uh, their, their their bookkeeping, right? What's on the inventory report. Because a lot of time, a mismanagement of inventory happens quite often where you can, where you think you have 20,000 units of something, but you go count it and you find out you only have 17,000 of it, right? So where'd that 3,000 unit go? You know, this could be spoilage. It could be mis- mishandled by the Im- by the fulfillment center. But that's three thousand dollars times whatever cost you had for that inventory. That's that's like that's that's misvalued. That's that's misappropriation now, right? And you have to write down that inventory now on your on your books because you don't have that, right? Because usually inventory is what they call an asset, right? It's something that values your company higher, but not if someone can't trust that this is the actual amount of inventory you have in your books. So having a uh, doing a cycle count gives that I would say that trust factor that you actually have this inventory value that you claim. Okay. Okay. I'll move on. Uh, hi, Alan. What if I detect, what should I do if I detect a large difference between my FBA inventory count as well as the balance sheet? Oh yeah. Perfect. Yeah. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. So <laughs> if you go and do an inventory count and you have a large difference, then unfortunately you have to go with, um, what you have actually on hand, right? <laughs> so if you're, if you're, it doesn't matter what your books claim. Your books can claim you have 50,000 units. You go count it and you have 40,000 units. I'm sorry, you, you only have 40,000 units. So you're gonna have to write down your, your, your GL to match, to match the 40,000 inventory you actually all have on hand. Okay. Yeah. Next question. This guy uh, wants to sell one of his companies, basically. Uh, I'm pretty sure he has multiple Amazon FBA brands. He says, Hi, Alan. I like to sell one brand out of my portfolio of companies, but all of my businesses are commingled into one account. So I'm guessing one business. Uh, what should I do? And uh, what do you advise? Yeah, I think um, immediately I, you should uh, find a good accountant to separate out your business. It, it'd, be worth, it'd be worth the time, right? If you have if you have three to four businesses in one, that's 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 that makes it very, very hard for someone to tell how much your brand is worth. Right, and it also it also doesn't speak very highly of your um your financial management skills, having it all in one entity or one account, right, or having all flow to it makes it is extremely confusing for anyone to look at, honestly. So you you want to immediately be able to separate that out and maybe even break it out on a legal entity level, so you have different LLCs managing each of your brand. So this very clean cut way of you know once someone does decide on a price with you you can just move that LLC over to them cleanly, right? While, while involving any of your other of your brands. So yeah, I would say immediate separation of all your brands' finances. 
right away if that's if that's your plan the next next uh, you know six to twelve months to sell one of your brands. Okay. Okay. Uh, next question: Why is there a discrepancy between my QuickBooks online account and Amazon Seller Central account? Um, very specific question. Yeah. It is a very specific question. Um, I mean, it it there was there's a lot of there's a lot of factors that may play into it. Um, I, I, I will have to look, I'll just like dig into your account to really see. But most of the time, you don't actually want to trust your uh, Amazon seller account side. Uh, you you kind of want to look at what you're actually collecting from your payment processor, mm -hmm. right? So your payment processor will send you what they call like a, either a, um, I think name the name escaped me right now, but basically it'll send you a, a form that, tells you exactly how much you earn for the year. And that is the form that gets submitted to the IRS, right? That's how you, that's how they, they kind of know that you at least have to report this much of your income to the IRS. So I would actually use that as a way to reconcile your books to make sure that it matches this number, this sales number on here, and not just rely on what your, what your Amazon seller central is telling you that you're earning for the year. Okay. Okay. Uh, next question. Hi, Alan. I've been selling through FBA since the May of this year. I filed an LLC in April of this year and I'm not filed taxes yet. I have assumed it'll be something I would have to deal with next April, but now I'm not sure. Do I need to file my taxes quarterly? How do I know if I do? And how do I know when these taxes are due? Super specific as well. Yeah. Yeah, it is very specific. Um, I mean, if you're if you just if you've been selling to FBA since May of this year, right? And then are you filing LLC in April of this year? Then yes, I would say you have to file your taxes for this year next. So so what was we're saying 2021, right? So by April 15, 2022, you will need to file taxes for that for this 2021 tax year. Yes. It doesn't matter what one month you started. And when when they're uh, when they're talking about do you need to file quarterly? That's dependent on your your revenue level. Um, if you start if you start making mid six figures in your business, I would say yes. Um, you would start triggering the need to for quarterly filings. If you're just starting out, you know, like seems like this person just started out selling, then maybe it's not needed yet, right? You can probably just get away with filing annually at this point. I, I would need I would need to know how how big this company has grown at this point. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Next question: uh, How can I find a buyer for my Amazon FBA business? So this guy wants to sell his FBA business, right? Go to M&A and stuff and sell his company, get a big payday. How does he find interested and prospective buyers for his company? Um, there's, there's a number of options find, to find it. Um, there's a lot of marketplace out there right now that helps with this. I think Empire Flipper is one of those that's really well known right now. Um, yeah, when I attend the Ecom World, they were always giving a, a talk about that. Um, but I mean, I think that's, that's one great way. Of course, you can always ask your network of other Amazon sellers to for their for, for, for they know anyone that 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 looking for businesses mm. and I think it also I saw some some really specific uh, venture capitalists that only advise online businesses right mm. they uh, they only target these type of businesses and if, and to make yourself look good I would definitely say you should have your you know your bookkeeping in a in a good spot very clean and very presentable for people at those level who really need, want to look at the metrics of your business. Um, you really want that to make sure you have an accurate valuation of your FBA business so they don't lowball you, for example, right? So you want to have put together a good, I would say, financial presentation with deck of your company and really understand um, the value of your company. Like where is the value of your company, right? Um, a lot of time it's, 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 it's really, I would say, part of it is your, the model that you're running. Um, if you're running Amazon FBA business, I'm assuming you're, you know, you're importing inventory right from somewhere but so it's one factor is going to be about how much of that inventory is going to be um you know how, how how unique is that inventory can anyone else go and buy that same inventory or is it just something that you were able to white label a brand so that only your brand it can 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 get that specific item right that's mm -hmm. something they're going to factor into second is just um your uh, possibly your you know your re your refund rate is how how often does customer refund that refund your item? Which can be a factor that you're looking at. And there is could be just they could just be buying your customer list, right? How valuable is your customer list? What is the lifetime value of it? What's your, what's your AOV for the, those those customers, right? 
So it's, there's a lot of different factors you got to look into, but you can also protect yourself by making sure you're, you know, how valuable each part of your business is before approaching a seller and be like, Hey, I think my business is worth X offer me X when, when not selling, you know? Okay. Uh, but like people, normal people don't know VCs, right? So, I mean, besides Empire, Empire Flipper, is there anything else that they can potentially explore? Uh, to sell their business? Um, yeah. I mean, I think, I think, I think just going to, going to any kind of those uh, online marketplaces is probably the best way to start unless you get approached by a venture capitalist, right? That, that, that is usually when you, you have know, really grown to a size where they really recognize you um, on, on the marketplace with where to approach you. I would say yeah, if you haven't made eight figures, you probably won't get approached by a VC. Uh, Empire Flipper is probably your best bet if you're just someone who hasn't made, made, made that level of income. Okay. Okay. Next question. Uh, this guy sells much by Amazon. So he asked, do I have to pay much by Amazon tax? I'm sorry, what's the word you're using? Uh, do I have to pay much by Amazon tax? So merchandise by Amazon tax. Merchandise Amazon tax? Uh, much by Amazon. So I think Amazon has this uh, merchandising program. And so he's asking whether uh, he has to pay uh, tax for that. Uh, actually, I don't know. I don't know. I, actually, I'm not aware of this am- merch Amazon okay. tax. <laughs> no worries. Yeah, we'll, we'll move on. Okay. Uh, next question. Hi, Alan. I don't have enough cash flow to buy new inventory. When should I consider taking out a loan? And how should I manage that cash flow? Can you please advise me? Yeah, I think this is, this is a very common issue we see e-commerce run into as they scale is that they're not very aware of and they haven't done, say, a cash flow forecast, right? Or they haven't looked at their burn rate. So then they, they get to a point where they run out of operating cash to keep their business running. And they're like, oh, shoot, how do I keep it going? How do I buy new inventory, right? And I think it's more of a problem for anyone that buys inventory than just drop shipping. Just drop shipping, obviously, you don't have as much upfront costs associated with it. Um, I, would, I would actually just take a, take a step back and really look carefully at your margins and see what you're able to handle, right? As far as the loans, like, do you have very strong margins mm-hmm. for, your, for whatever you're buying? Um, mm-hmm. You know, are you, are you very profitable? Like, you know, if you buy this inventory, can you quickly turn it over? Like, how, how, how much time does it take to turn over a, a unit of inventory that you buy, right? How much time does it take to turn over 5,000 unit, 10,000 unit? That really gives you that risk assessment that you really want to do before you go take out a loan. And of course, as you take on that loan, you also want to look at what kind of loan is it? Is it just a straightforward loan where, and what's the interest rate attached to it, right? And it's a collateral loan where if I don't pay back this loan, mm. they can just take my inventory, take my business mm. from me, right? So there's a lot of, I would say, comprehensive risk assessment you want to do before you go take a loan and see if it's worth the risk of yep. taking on that loan in your business. So yeah, you want to do that financial assessment of your situation before taking on any kind of loan. Okay. Okay. Uh, what are the quality, uh, sorry, what are the quarterly estimated taxes and when do I have to actually pay them? Yeah, so quarterly estimated taxes, um, very common question on what you have to pay when you're not making enough tax withholdings. So just, I know that's, I'm using a lot of w- words that people may not know. So let me, let me take a step back. So if you ever work like say a nine to five job, right? Where an employer just, take, uh, just pays you a paycheck say every two weeks, right? So what actually happens when they give you that paycheck is if you look at the pay stub carefully, the employer is already taking out a portion of your tax withholding for you, right? That's why I want you have, everyone always complain, you know, when they get their pay stuff, oh my God, why is it only this much, this little money? My paycheck's so small, right? But that's because they are already taking out the tax for you. And what happens is, depending on what you select for them to take, uh, different, uh, diff- different options, right? At the end of uh, the year, when you do your file taxes, you could possibly be getting a refund for it because they may have withhold too much tax for you. Well, as an entrepreneur, you're basically a business owner. There is no one responsible for doing your tax withholding for you, which means, you know, if you don't report it, you're actually withholding zero, right? You're actually not giving the government any money because you, you're not an employee anymore, right? Someone else is not doing that for you. So because of that factor, the government says, no, we, we don't trust you enough <laughs> that you're going to do it all at the year end, right? So they expect you to, to do these quarterly estimated taxes um, because, they want you to, to uh, pay them as you earn the money. And if you don't, you basically get faced with um, penalties and interest and on your tax bill at the end of the year, which you, you, you try to avoid as much as possible because that's just giving free money away. It could, it could be as much as 6% right, um, of your bill. So what happens is you want to make these quarterly tax payment. They usually occur at these, during these times. April 15 is usually the first one. 
um, then June 15, October 15, and then January 15 of the following year. Um, basically, you um, usually you just break it out into your um, what you owe last year on your tax bill, and you divide that number, and you pay those in four in your installment. That's that's good enough. That that's one way of doing it. Another way is basically if you're able to more forecast how much of re- how much of revenue expense you have this year, you can also base it based on that. It's an estimate, but the IRS basically rather you pay something to them than nothing. If you pay nothing, you can get penalized for it. That that's basically the end of the story. Okay. Okay. So we this wrapping up the Amazon FBA section. Now we move on to kind of like uh, influencers and content creators who kind of have questions as well. Okay. So the first question is. Hi, Alan. I am an influencer slash YouTuber. He basically make money. He makes money from YouTube AdSense, uh, affiliate marketing, uh, sponsorship, merch sort of thing. Uh, are there any specific taxes that I need to know uh, that I need to file? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's great for you to, 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 to submit a question. But And, and I, I would say, um, you know, you're, you're really subject to the same type of taxes that an e-com owner would be subject to. Basically, your, your normal federal and state taxes, depending on where you're located uh, for all of your income. But don't worry, there's also a lot of deductions available that you can take for the income you're making because, you know, you have a lot of things that you use for your business as a YouTube creator, such as, you know, your, your video production equipment, right? Those that's your camera, your video recorder, any kind of cables that you're buying, clothes, right? If you're a type of YouTuber that, that wear certain clothes to be on, on camera, um, software that you use uh, for your channel, any kind of video editing software and things like that. So yeah, so th- those are the two I, w- I would say you, you're, you're subject to, uh, unless you own a some sort of like merch business also attached. Mm-hmm. I don't know some YouTuber have like a merch yep. store. Yep. Then you may be subject to sales tax with that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Next question. Uh, when YouTube pays me uh, Google AdSense, does YouTube take out taxes for me? Yeah, actually, we, we, we have done some research for this um, for, for our clients. But basically, actually, beginning uh, last month, because we're in July right now, June 2021, mm-hmm. Google will actually start withholding U.S. taxes on your earnings you generate from viewers in the U.S. So you, you'll, st- you'll start asking you to start entering your tax info. If not, if you don't enter your tax info, what they're going to do is automatic, take an automatic at 25%. Of your total earnings worldwide, it's that yeah, it's rough. You don't want it. you don't want that because that's worldwide. But if you submit it, then um, they don't they don't they don't they're only gonna withhold the U.S. viewers. See, so if you have a lot of international viewers, they won't take that part. Just the U.S. viewer side. So you you'll get a, a much higher uh, you know earning payout if you just submit your information instead of letting them do the cal- calculation themselves. Okay, Ken, uh, I'll skip the next question because uh, I think you answered this just now. So okay. how much do you need to earn? to pay or to start paying YouTube taxes? Uh, legally, $400. You will need to start declaring that income to the IRS. Um, Google is required to give you a what they call a 1099 form when you have made $600 or more. So when you have hit that mark, the IRS will have a record of your earnings, basically. So if you don't submit, they'll know. <laughs> but then if you, if you just earn like $200 for fun, then yeah, you can get away with not, not reporting at all. Okay. Ken, next one. Uh, do I need to set aside money uh, for YouTube taxes, uh, besides um, yeah. YouTube taxes, sorry. Uh, besides YouTube taxes. Okay. Yeah. hundred percent. Um, you probably want to have, um, some kind of emergency fund. Uh, you probably want to have several months of operating expense to keep your business running. If anything goes wrong, right. If you, if you get sick or anything like that, you probably want an equipment budget, right. If your equipment, if you're, I think for as part of a YouTuber, having the, the whole webcam or video recorder or camera is very important, right. You want to have a budget for that. And any, any money for repair and maintenance of, of these bro- uh, having a broken camera or computer, like your laptop is like one of your biggest assets, right? For your business. Mm. So that's, that's, that's like, that's a definite write off for your business, by the way, if you need a new laptop for your YouTube business. Um, so I would say those are some of the things you just need to make sure you can keep your business running, right? You want to have enough operational cash for to pay for any kind of subscription that could be part of your YouTube channel. Um, uh, those are things I would say besides taxes. Okay. Okay, last question for YouTubers. Uh, Alan, what are the top tax deductions uh, that I can take as a YouTuber? Yeah, it really, it, that, that's the question really depends on how, how, how big of a YouTuber you are. Um, 
and there was this different levels of expenses, but in general terms, you can definitely take um, a business deduction for say your cell phone, right? Any kind of business email and data that you use for your phone, that's the part you can use. Your internet, right? Your internet is a big part of being a YouTuber. Well, internet, you can't be a YouTuber. Uh, your business meals, any kind of meals you conduct while doing YouTubing can be considered a business meal. Um, any kind of travel you do for your channel, right? If you, if you just have a travel channel or travel vlog, um, that's part of your, that's part of con conducting your YouTube business. Um, transaction fees that Google may take out for um, part of your YouTube business. Um, any kind of props you use in your in your videos, right? Any kind of props to help help your videos. Um, you can also look for retirement savings plans for your for your YouTube channel, health saving plans, health insurance. Um, and then uh, another thing is if you just happen to have a very large equipment. For your for your YouTubers, like I know some some YouTubers are like stunt like stunt people, right? They have like this huge uh, machinery or equipment. They have it. Then you can also take a lot of um, accelerate depreciation on these large write off. Like basically, you get a, a near hundred a near hundred percent write off for these equipment mm -hmm. the year that you bought it and put it to use for any, if anything you buy for that. So it really depends on what type of YouTuber you are. That just certain classes of expense that just is just for you. Okay, okay, we'll move on. Uh, so the last one we're coming to the end uh, is for SaaS or software as a service entrepreneurs, right? So these guys are the software guys. Uh, they know how to code and make product. And basically they made, they made a, ton of, a ton of money with the recurring revenue model. And so some of them have some questions as well. Okay, so first question is, um, hi, Alan, uh, how do I calculate my MRR uh, and think about revenue growth? Yeah, MMR by itself is a very easy calculation, right? It, it, it's, only, it's only involving two, two factors. It's just your average revenue per account times the total account that month equals your MRR, right? Mm -hmm. And at your average value revenue per account is a very crucial measure, especially for um, SaaS businesses, right? And you kind of arrive at that figure by taking the average of how much all your customers are paying and dividing it by the total number of customers that month. That's it. So determine your MR, you multiply that figure by your total number of customers. So if you have a hundred customers paying an average of $50 per month, your MMR is $5,000. Just, just, just that. So you, you, that, that number, you kind of want to see grow, right? You want you want that, cause that's one of like the primary factor of a SaaS business is MMR is how, how, how high you can raise that. And that's going to turn a lot of your valuation, you know, as, as you look at a SaaS business ready to exit and ready to sell. Okay. The next question. Uh, how should I structure my financial statements or accounts for my SaaS company? Uh, and what financial statements should I prepare uh, beforehand? Yeah. So the first thing you want to do when you set up any, any type of uh, financial statement is you want to set up your chart of accounts, right? Basically, you want to give every one of your expenses a, a, a place to be, a home, if you may. Right? Basically, a specific category that they, they should belong in. Um, you want to get a, yourself a good accounting system that can track based on cost centers or these tracking categories. And, uh, you know, it's it, depending on what software you use it, and QuickBook is called class tracking and, and zero is called categories. And usually the, the one that you want to track is like cost of sales, um, sales and marketing, research development and general and admin costs. Right. Mm -hmm. And then when you, whenever you have a transaction, you'll tag it with a GL number and a tracking category, one of those four above. And basically what this will enable you to do is later generate a, a very accurate looking income statement showing the expenses associated with just that class, that cost center, right? Just sales and marketing or just R&D, right? And then that will let you have all your metrics covered on the cost side. And then of course, as a, as a, as a SaaS business, your MMR is very, very important, right? You want, you want to know these, these kind of metrics also in your financials, your total MMR, your booking, your churn, your churn rate, how many people you know, leave, leave after a couple months of your SaaS business. And so you usually want your accounting system to also be supplemented by some kind of like subscription billing system that can track all these kind of metrics. And that's also a huge consideration for SaaS business to add in your repertoire. Um, and then some key metrics that you want to look at, right? As a SaaS business, I'm sure uh, as SaaS, when you probably know all this is customer acquisition costs, right? Um, your monthly recurring rev your revenue, of course, your MMR, your customer retention rate, your churn rate, and your lead to customer conversion rate. So a lot of metrics you want to keep in mind um, to make sure that you understand how much your business is, first of all, if it's growing in the right direction 
And, and if not, why is it not? Why do you have high turnover? Why do you have high churn? Mm-hmm. And se- secondly, you know, when you're ready to exit the business, how much I sh- can, can I value my business, right? Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay, next question. Um, I'm looking to exit and sell my software company, my SaaS company. What financial statements do I have to prepare for my SaaS company and what should I look out for? Yeah, if you're looking to exit your business, you definitely need, um, you know, these four really, you know, gap financial statements, right? These are generally accepted accounting principal financial statements. You need your balance sheet, you need an income statement, you need a statement of cash flow, and you need a statement of shareholders equity, right? A balance sheet basically just provides very detailed information about a company's assets, liabilities, and shareholders equity. Um, and then an income statement is a report that shows how much revenue a company earned over a specific time period, usually for a year or some portion of a year if you started mid-year. And it also shows all the costs and expenses uh, associated with earning that revenue. And of course, it shows your, your profit, uh, your, your net profit at the end of the day. Um, your income statement also shows your earning per share if you, if you happen to be a C-Corp company. Um, and then your shareholders equity, or sometimes called your net worth report, is basically, it's the money that will be left if a company basically sold all of its assets and paid off all of its liabilities. That's the, the level of money belongs to the shareholder, the owner of the company. So that, that's what shareholder equity statement says. And your cash flow statement is basically shows your company's inflow and outflow of cash. And this is important because, you know, a, a company's livelihood usually is cash. Yeah, the, more, the more cash you have usually shows more, the more health inside your company. Unless you just, you actually owe a lot of this cash, right, <laughs> to other people. And maybe not, but usually that's, that's what a cash flow statement does. It shows you at the end of the day how much, how much free cash flow you have. Um, available and that, that shows how, how well run your company has been uh, through the year or many years of your company. So having these four financial statements is just really the, the basic essential that anyone's going to ask to look at um, before they consider buying your company. Okay. Ken, next one. Uh, how do you advise uh, me to do revenue recognition for subscription-based software SaaS companies? So you probably want to explain revenue recognition to the audience. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Revenue recognition is basically, um, it's a term by say saying like, at what point in time can you recognize revenue? Right. And I think a lot of people out there um, think that, uh, think that, you know, as soon as they make the cash money, they can recognize revenue. Right. So basically if, if you think about it, if you're a SaaS business, um, $10,000 hit your bank. Right. And you and, and you as business owner probably think, yep, I can recognize all ten thousand dollars as revenue. Mm-hmm. That is usually not the case. Okay. Most SaaS businesses should actually be run on the on the accrual basis, because that's what's expected. Um, and what, what the accrual basis basically says is a ten, yeah, you you got ten thousand dollars cash, but you actually can't recognize all ten thousand dollars because this customer, he actually was is on an annual plan. He prepaid for that. You know, so that ten thousand dollars, yeah, you actually can only recognize twelve, uh, one twelfth of that money. Um, basically, only you only can recognize the revenue that you earn for the the month that the customer actually used your service, right? So you can only recognize eight hundred, like eight hundred thirty three dollars of it, and the rest is what they call deferred revenue, which means revenue you haven't earned the right to say that you earned that revenue yet. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's, I mean, there's, there's a lot of fact, there's a lot of other factors you got to kind of consider as part of your SaaS revenue, revenue, make, make plan is, um, you know, the customer canceled the subscription midway. What do you do about your revenue, revenue, revenue recognition? If they upgrade from a monthly plan to an annual plan in the middle of the year, what's your revenue recognition number? If they downgrade from a higher plan to a lower plan, if the customer is unable to pay for the service that they render. And then of course it gets even more complicated if your SaaS business is, is you bundle things with it, right? If you bundle set of fees with it, support fees, consultation services, customization, what happens to your revenue recognition? So it really, it's really not as simple as people think when they uh, talk about revenue recognition, thinking that, you know, whatever cash hits my bank account is what I can recognize. That's not, that's not true. You know, the customer, the, the, um, until the customer actually uses or uses the service, you can't recognize that money as okay. revenue. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, next question. Uh, hi, Alan. Do you have any softwares that you recommend for SaaS startups to do their accounting slash bookkeeping? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the one we always recommend to most um, business, the online business starting out is definitely QuickBooks Online just because of how uh, well-known it is and how often it's updated, right? Um, it, the scalability is there. 
um, you know, most SaaS investments are growth based. So you want some, some kind of accounting software that keeps up with your business. And um, QuickBook Online can definitely do that. It has a good amount of automation. You no know, SaaS is a fast paced business, but um, Intuit has a lot of um, different kind of, I'll say, uh, connections with apps, with different kind of apps that you can, that you can do like one-to-one. And of course you want multi-business support. So, um, you know, SaaS can involve a lot of different kind of business types, right? And you kind of want your, your, your online accounting software to be able to keep up with that, right? Um, you know, zero is another great option here, but whatever accounting software you choose, I kind of mentioned in the other question, you also want some kind of subscription billing system set up alongside with mm-hmm. to help you keep track of those really important factors, right? Like your churn rate, uh, your MMR, your booking rate, and things like that is you want kind of want to complement your accounting software with those kind of metric um, mm-hmm. accounting system. Mm-hmm. Great. Okay. Understood. Uh, next question. Uh, deferred revenue versus accrued revenue for SES. Uh, how do I deal with this and uh, what they choose, I guess? This is question. Yeah. I, I mean, the deferred revenue is very much uh, one, one, one of the basic principle of accrued accounting, right? For revenue recognition. Um, kind of mentioned the other, other question too. But basically, you know, when uh, you you get a one year subscription for something, right? You have not earned that revenue yet. You earned it over the term of that subscription. So if it's a twelve month subscription, and you this is the first month, you only earn one twelfth of that, right? One month of it. So divert revenue is basically uh, advance payment from a customer for future goods and services that they have not rendered yet, they have not used yet. And it's basically also called unearned revenue, uh, deferred revenue is, and it's basically something that's going to be going to be delivered for in the future. So, um, I mean, I, w- I would say that that's something you just need to really realize that that's what deferred revenue is. Well, on the other hand, accrued revenue is kind of like the opposite of that, right? Accrued revenue refers to expenses that are recognized on the book before they have actually been paid. So this actually doesn't happen that often now in, in the days of auto, uh, automatic payments, right? In mm-hmm. of credit card days, but you can think of a, of a time of, you know, where uh, a customer may be, you have to invoice them, right? And then they, they're like a, a customer that you invoice instead of they paying you automatically by credit card. So that means that they uh, they may have already used up a month of the, of, of the service of your company, right? Mm-hmm. But then after you had actually been, been charged of that, but that, but you're allowed, you're allowed to recognize that revenue already for that one month because they would use one month of that, of your, of your service. So it's kind of like the little opposite. And it's, it's really about uh, recognizing when, uh, when that service is rendered versus cash earn, right? When it versus cash input. So basically when you're running a SaaS business, don't look at cash. Look at when you actually perform that service for the customer as, as the main factor of when you can recognize revenue. Okay. Yeah. Uh, complicated. Yeah, <laughs> a little bit complicated, I got to say, yeah. Okay. Uh, hi, Alan. How do I manage deferred revenue for subscriptions? Is there anything I need to do on the journal entry site uh, or the balance sheet to uh, recognize it? Yeah. So when, when you, when you have a deferred revenue, basically um, you can think of it and uh, hopefully it's the simplest term is that, you know, if normally you're thinking you have $10,000 cash, right. As uh, I, I know I shouldn't talk journal entries, but basically what you, what, what, what happens was you have to do double entry journal entry usually for businesses. And when you have $10,000 cash, that's cash that you had to book a number to cash for sure. Cause you had, you have that cash coming in and you're supposed to book a number to revenue, right? But as a subscription business, you can't take all $10,000, right? If you basically, you only earn $1,000 of it, what you have to do is basically you move $9,000 of revenue from your revenue account and put it towards an account called deferred revenue. So really um, on your income statement, if you're showing to someone, hey, yo, I made $10,000 in my business. No, that's not true. You actually only made $1,000 of revenue in your business for that month. $9,000 of that is defer. Yeah. So a lot of time um, companies inflate their business thinking they made $10,000 revenue and can recognize that, but that's absolutely false actually. And that gives them a false sense of security thinking they have $10,000 of revenue when really they need to spend the next, you know, nine or 11 months earning the rest of their revenue for that customer. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I'll come to the second last question. Uh, hi, Alan. Why is it essential uh, for my company to do accrual accounting? Can't I just do, uh, I guess, cash accounting? 
Yeah. So I mean, I mean, technically, you you can do cash. It just it just doesn't match your business model really well, right? Because you're you're always making because like if you think about it, and 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 in contrast to an ecom business, right? Where um, like if you think about ecom business, right? Right, Jonathan, you a customer comes to your store, buys that item, right? You ships that item to the customer. Then you're 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 done. You're fulfilled exactly. Your yeah. your service been fulfilled. You've been you delivered the item. You you recognize yeah. the full revenue, right? That forty nine ninety five item, right? Mm -hmm. Where and difference between a SaaS business is a lot of time you may be paying for an, an annual plan, six month plan, a multi month service, right? Mm -hmm. Where um you you're 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 making cash that doesn't correlate this at the same rate as your revenue. So that makes it very, very um, inaccurate when you're when you're looking at cash basis, which is why most SaaS business, if they think they're gonna go anywhere, they switch to SaaS uh, accrual accounting immediately, which is a lot more complicated to do. As, as I've been <laughs> trying to explain here, but it's just a lot more complicated yep. accounting to do. And yep. usually, when you do accrual accounting, you you do want to hire a professional to kind of handle that for you. Um, but essentially, that's that's the main reason, right? Of a SaaS business, unless you offer some reason only offer monthly plans to your customers. Um, then it's very hard to match up your uh, your your revenue and your your expenses and your cash at the same at the rate you're supposed to, um, and that's one of the reasons why most SaaS businesses go accrue method immediately to make sure they have that. And and under, it, it also complicate things. Say like you know like like the other day I bought um, I think like an antivirus or something, right? And this antivirus comes with like one year uh, maintenance or something, right? Like if I have any problems with my antivirus, they'll give me support, right? But for that for that company, they can't they can't even recognize that one year maintenance fee, like they 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 didn't earn it at all. They have to split that over the twelve months that I use their service. Uh, they can only earn one twelfth of that maintenance fee even. So this is not even the software portion, right? This is the maintenance portion of their uh, revenue recognition. They can't even do that. They have to split that out, out of twelve months. So there's lots of so there's so many factors of it, and you know, and there's so much um, free movement usually up on the customer side where they can upgrade, downgrade. Mid, mid midway through that really messes up how much revenue recognition you can have on your income statement that you know you really want to have someone that uh, are very familiar with your business to work that out for you and model that for you okay okay uh last question okay uh mm -hmm. when do you need to hire a cfo uh for my SaaS startup so i'll, I'll say SaaS companies uh they start very slow but then they grow fast after they uh, get product market fit, right? So when is it advisable to get uh, a CFO? Yeah, so um, I think I think I don't I think a CFO. It's usually when you want to hire a CFO, which is which is going to obviously going to be uh, uh, not anything as cheap, right? Yep. And especially in house CFO, it really depends on your the complexity of your revenue model. It's kind of what we what we kind of touch on touch on is like how complicated is it to reckon to do revenue recognition in your company, right? Mm -hmm. If it's not straightforward, if you have a lot of embedded um, things within your SaaS product that you're selling, if it's you know maybe some SaaS is multi year that multi year contracts attached to it, right? If it's very hard to separate out and know how much re re revenue you can recognize. That's one reason why you might want to have CFO. If you just have a lot of metrics you need to measure, you know, tons of things to track to ensure the success of your business, and you're not, you're not a person that's very good at math or very good at finance, that could be a reason why you want to hire a CFO to figure all that out for you so they can, they can actually tell you accurately the help of your business, right? So you're not just blinded by how much cash you're taking in, but really your, your churn rate is super high, right? Maybe you, you are getting 100 customers a month, but you're losing 80 of them. You know, yep. but you think, you, oh, I'm doing great, but actually you're not, you're doing, actually doing terribly. Um, if, you, if you're actually planning to do any kind of fundraising, right, or you plan to exit a company, that's probably a great time to have a CFO who can help you um, network with venture capitalists or other people who are, present your company in the most favorable light um, mm -hmm. to these people um, to help you get the biggest exit for your company. That usually, like if you're going to IPO, if you're going to do anything like that, you want a CFO that understands your business and can really, you know, kind of be almost be a marketer for your business, be a salesperson for your business to market it to these guys. And, you know, beyond these points, um, you know, if you're gonna hire a CFO, you probably need a full team beneath that that handles all the tasks that CFO is probably not gonna do, right? CFO is probably only gonna look at the big picture for your company, right? But you're gonna mm -hmm. need someone that's managing your account payable, receivable, your bookkeeping, uh, your payroll and expense reimbursement, reconcil reconciliations, monthly closing of the books, financial reporting and an analysis, you know, 
board meeting prep because the CFO might not be the one that's doing the actual deck, right? Cash flow and forecasting, taxes. So there's a lot of these things that I just just hiring a CFO is not going to cover. So I wouldn't jump and invite to a CFO. I would either start out uh, by hiring a you know an outsource team or an in-house team that that can do all these tasks for your company, you know, well. Because the CFO, if, he's, if, you, if you're gonna just hire straight up a CFO and he's gonna step into this and he's like, yo, you have, you have one accountant, do you have anyone that's been doing your bookkeeping, anyone doing your taxes, and you say no, that CFO is gonna run for the hills. You know, he's not gonna, yeah, he's not he's gonna not want gonna to be a CFO for your company. Basically. No, no, no. You want, you expect yeah. to pay a CFO like, you know, 300K plus to do your bookkeeping? Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah, that's not happening. Okay. Okay, okay. Got it. Okay, so. Uh, I don't know, we've come to the end. I'd like to thank you very much for your time. Uh, I know you answered a lot of questions from the audience, so uh, I'd like to thank you. Okay, so guys, um, if you want to get uh, the tax-free e-commerce course, uh, we've got a 50% discount for you guys as well. So you can go to freecashflow.io slash course. And basically in the discount code, you can put OXG-50. That's OXG-50 to get 50%. Uh, of uh, Alan's course, basically. So it's going to teach you everything from uh, accounting, bookkeeping, um, also like international sellers outside the US. This is helpful for you if you want to incorporate uh, inside the US. And uh, basically everything you need to know about uh, tax and accounting um, for e-commerce specifically, okay? Um, and if you want to talk to Alan specifically as well, uh, you can go to freecashflow.io slash book. Alan, is that correct? Yep, that's right. Yep, so freecashflow.io slash book to talk to Alan and then freecashflow.io slash course uh, to actually get the course for yourself. Okay, so Alan, thank you so much for your time. Um, and uh, <laughs> yes, th th thank you so much for your time. Yep. Yeah, thank you so much, John, for having me on again. It's a pleasure. And if does anyone have any other additional questions for me, feel free to you know, you know drop me with Jonathan a note and uh, happy to jump on and answer it again uh, next time. Okay, Ken, thank you guys. Yeah, sounds good. Thanks, everyone.